comments and questions. Good afternoon. I'm very grateful to the Palestine Center for in inviting me and including me in this conversation. It's a privilege uh, to be here. I have been asked to talk about the place of Iran, uh, chief, uh, as you know, on the axis of evil. And uh, I will be talking about Iran within the time uh, that I have been given. But I'd like first to start with an anecdote that sets the mood of how I will talk about Iran. In January 2003, uh, I uh, was responsible for organizing a Palestinian film festival at Columbia University where I teach. By hook and crook, we put together 35 featured documentary and short films, and we showed it. It was a huge success and so forth. Uh, among other things, I made it to the list of 101 most dangerous professors uh, in, this, uh, in this country. <laughs> Uh, I've been part of short at least six of the original six that Daniel Parks put together uh, and even an earlier list by Lynn Cheney as suspicious professors. So watch for uh, where you are. Um, after our, the conclusion of our, fe uh, of our uh, festival, uh, my colleagues and I decided it was obscene for us to show these Palestinian festivals in New York and not in Palestine. So in February 2004, uh, I was part of a group of people. We went to Palestine and uh, beginning with Jerusalem and to Bethlehem and uh, other places, showing some of these films in, uh, in, ma in makeshift movie houses. There's absolutely not a single movie theater in East Jerusalem. We use the lobby of YMCA in East Jerusalem as a place to show our, our, our films. The first day that I arrived, I, I arrived mid midnight uh, in Ben-Gurion, and all my Palestinian friends and colleagues were locked up in East Jerusalem, they couldn't pick me up. There was a driver picked me up and took me to uh, my hotel, Christmas hotel. And I was too excited and too uh, nervous to go to bed. So I started walking on Salah al-Din Avenue towards uh, Haram al-Sharif. Uh, it was early hours in the morning by now and the Haram al-Sharif was surrounded by Israeli army. And uh, uh, I was just going towards uh, the, the Haram, and uh, one Israeli officer asked me, uh, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the Haram al-Sharif. He said, well, where is you, uh, uh, you have to be a Muslim to go there. I said, well, I'm a Muslim. And they said, where is your passport? I said, well, I left my passport in my hotel, but you can't tell from my passport because I travel with an American passport. And I said, okay, so he let me go, but there was a second tier of Israeli soldiers, this time right uh, on the outside door of the Haram al-Sharif. And again, I was asked, where are you going? I'm going to decide, we have to be Muslim. I'm a Muslim. Where's your passport? I don't have my passport. And as this is going uh, back and forth, the huge door to, I think it's called Babul Osud uh, door, was open, and a huge Palestinian guy came out and told him, uh, let him in. Let him in. He's a Muslim. So uh, I was let in, and as soon as I entered and he closed the door, he turned to me and said, are you Muslim? <laughs> I became nervous, and I said, yeah, I'm a Muslim. And he said, well, let me hear you recite the Quran. And uh, I got a bit nervous, and uh, for some bizarre reason that I haven't analyzed it, I opted for the second chapter of the Qur'an, Al-Baqarah, which is the longest chapter of the Qur'an. <laughs> so I started, Alif Lam Mim Zalik Al-Kitab al He said, no, 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 this is too long. Why don't you just say the Fatiha? <laughs> so I said, fine. I said my Fatiha. And as soon as I finished, he said, Ahlam al-Sahdan, you are not only a Muslim, you are also an Iranian, because you can't tell the difference between your Qaf and your Ghayy. <laughs> Uh, not knowing that since my childhood I've had a aversion to uh, Arabs correcting my Arabic because of my poor mother when uh, she used to uh, recite her uh, prayers some uh, wise ass mullah had, had told her that at the end of the Fatiha is not غير المغذوب عليهم ولا as she used to say ولا الزالين with the Persian they say zalin but ذالين 
So when she got to the point, I, I, I would see her physically shivering when she got to the point, <laughs> how to say that, the, 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 because her Persian intonation was to go to the Z, but this uh, wise as Mullah has said, no, we have to say that. And I mean, for her, she's speaking to, to her God. So being made conscious of her, it was not doing us. Uncertainty, uncertainty as to how to pronounce and how to say things, the, the, the shady area between the two uh, certainties is what I would like to talk about today. And as a result, not the, the, not the actuality of war, but about the possibility of war, about the state of war. Okay? The distinguished chair of the previous panel asked, shows up, uh, hands up, as how many of you think that U.S. will attack Iran? Uh, before the, term, uh, the end of these uh, things, and none of you thought. Uh, what I'm going to dwell on is, in fact, this uncertainty that has been going on at least since the uh, uh, State of the Union address in January 2002 that Iran was put on the axis of evil that we don't know. Is U.S. going to attack or not? Uh, people up until this financial crisis were thinking of October surprise, a la traditional October surprise, that there would be an attack on Iran and uh, will obviously benefit the incumbent uh, party, and uh, we'll have the nightmare of uh, McCain-Palin uh, situation. By the way, uh, speaking of putting my politics on the, uh, on the table, I am going to vote for uh, Barack Obama. Uh, not that I'm not appalled by his despicable position towards the politics of the region, but simply because the idea of a McCain-Palin presidency gives me nightmare more than the nightmare that we have had over the last uh, eight years. I have a teacher who took us 32 years to tell people it is Iran and Iraq. <laughs> and now we have this woman from, uh, from Alaska. We're back to Iran and Iraq. And, uh, I'm just too old. I've been in this business for two uh, uh, teaching. I can't start teaching a new generation of the students Iran, not Iran, Iraq, not Iraq. <laughs> Uh, let me start by two stories that are out in the street. There are two stories out, out in the street. One, is to, one story is that Iran is a rogue state. Iran is a terrorist state. Iran supports terrorism. Iran supports Hamas. Iran prevents uh, the Oslo Accord. Iran is, supports Hezbollah. Iran sends uh, arm and uh, Shahab uh, uh, missiles and they attack uh, things. Iran uh, has a president who denies Holocaust. Iran is, uh, what else, uh, it wants to wipe out Israel from a, a map of the earth. earth. I mean, that, this is, these are the things, one story that we have, and I mean, there are some elements of truth to that story. There is another story that United, uh, this is a story mostly here in, in American uh, uh, streets, as it goes. The, sto the, uh, the alternative story, which is mostly comes from, uh, to us from Tehran, is that United States is, uh, is an empire, is imperialism, it just, uh, after the collapse of Soviet Union, it does whatever it wants to do, attacks uh, Afghanistan and uh, thousands of uh, casualties, attacks Iraq and, and other thousands of casualties, it's a monopolar imperial project, and it's not going to work, and uh, we, we can't stand up to this, and, uh, and so forth. And again, there is some element of truth to this story as well. And uh, what I'm going to propose to you is a series of facts that, in fact, posits uh, Islamic Republic of Iran and United States as not potential, but actual allies. Actual allies over the last, at least uh, since September the 11th, in many significant ways. Let's first flash back to uh, uh, the revolution, Iranian revolution of 1977-1979. Those of you who are my age, you remember that it was a massive popular revolution and it had appeal throughout the region, in the Arab world, in North Africa, in Central Asia, all the way, I mean, from India to Morocco, it had an appeal that uh, a, a popular uprising, a mass revolution against a, a, a corrupt monarchy uh, armed to the teeth by the uh, United States managed to topple uh, uh, that monarchy. And at the time, it was not an Islamic revolution. It was a subsequently Islamicized through the hostage crisis and the Salman Rushdie affair. I mean, the, the details of it, uh, uh, you know. United States and its European allies, they don't have any patience. I come with rashes with this European thing about how could you work for George Bush, coming from people who voted for Tony Blair and so forth. So, and its European allies, 
they were petrified by this uh, uh, prospect, and they created two buffer zones around the Islamic uh, Revolution. One was in the form of Saddam Hussein, right, heavily armed to his teeth by United States and his European allies, particularly the French, the famous shake hand of uh, 